Yeah, so really uh, what I'm trying to do here is, is basically we've had a whole bunch of researchers and our postdocs work on trying to put together an interpretation of the um, geophysics from the Timmins area. And so uh, I'm going to talk first of all about the integration of the seismic and the MT. And in the latter part, I want to bring in some ANT that we've done, which is higher resolution. So try and bring that all together. So this is the authorship of a paper that was just uh, submitted to uh, Journal of Geophysical Research as of uh, early February. So um, we had a lot of back and forth with this uh, and some uh, review from uh, John Percival internal, so that was very helpful. So uh, we're going to go through that and then <clears throat> the latter part I'll talk about the AMT. <coughs> Sorry. So first of all, I just want to put things into perspective. We're in the western, along the western part of the uh, Dester Porcupine Fault um, in the Timmins Camp, which is uh, the largest uh, gold camp within the uh, Abitibi. Um, and, and the interesting thing about the Dester Porcupine, there's, uh, it's a very well-endowed uh, regional fault, um, probably 100 million ounces produced, roughly. Um, <clears throat> but the bulk of it is from Timmins. And then contrast that with the uh, Cadillac Lurda Lake Fault, similar amount, slightly more, but that's distributed along 250 kilometers in fairly equal endowment. So there's some differences in the two fault systems. But what I really wanted to talk to you about is just to set the setting, uh, um, the setting for, for Timmins is that that whole package uh, between those two faults is, is the southern Abitibi and actually continuing south of that. But um, uh, really, uh, the Abitibi traditionally way back 30 years or so or more ago, it was subdivided into northern and the southern and we've heard talk about it, the more basin and dome-like uh, structure in the north versus the more linear uh, structural elements to the south. But there are other differences uh, between the northern and southern Abitibi. And so on the right here, I have basically the um, stratigraphy of the southern Abitibi. And uh, there are about uh, <coughs> six, uh, five or six um, assemblages shown in pastel colors, which are on the map here, representing uh, volcanic <coughs> deposition from about 2770 million years to about 2695, roughly. And uh, no, not much sedimentation at all, just iron formations and some uh, very fine grain sediments, uh, interflow sediments here and there. But after that, we have an unconformity and there's uh, 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 clastic sediment aprons that are sort of deposited in many places in, in the southern Abitibi and the north. I'll get that to a minute. But these are dominantly uh, deep marine turbidites. And then, um, then there's another unconformity in the la last episode of sediments, which are alluvial flanfluvial of sediments. Um, they're the Tamiskaming. And they're deposited after about uh, 27 uh, 2676 uh, to about 2670 million years. The difference in the northern Abitibi is basically the stratigraphy here is, has all this uh, older part of the volcanic package, but it doesn't have the upper two uh, assemblages, the Tisdale <coughs> and the Blake River. So from about 2710 to 2695 is missing up here. And in addition, we have very similar sedimentary packages in the north, but they're about 10 million years older. And we recognize that all this sedimentation was the result of uplift and some sort of tectonism, and there are a whole series of, of deformation events. Well, the sediments to the north are also associated with uh, similar types of deformation events, but they're again older. So. Um, where am I going here? Oh, here so again, looking, this is the map that um, uh, uh, we produced in uh, 2008 for the whole of the Abitibi as a collaboration between uh, Ontario and Quebec. 
And again, I'm showing the subdivision between the northern and southern Abitibi. And this is the area that we we're covering for the, uh, the geophysics for that, that I'm going to be talking about and is included in the paper. But looking at the differences again, if we look here, basically, these are the assemblages that are missing from the northern part of the Abitibi. We have the, the sedimentary assemblages here in the northern Abitibi. The, the porcupine up there is called the uh, uh, copatina, and the opamisca is the temiscum. So there's something different. I think why I'm talking about this is I think where we've done our work maybe uh, provides some evidence of, of, of the nature of the contact between northern and southern Abitibi. <clears throat> Sorry. Oops, wrong way. So this is the area that we've uh, done the uh, magnetotelluric. Um, it's the Timmins camp. The, all the gold deposits are in this area here. Over 75 million ounces of gold produced from the Timmins uh, porcupine camp. But the area is also dowed with base metals. We have uh, VMS deposits. There's been lots of talk about that. But this is the largest VMS deposit within the whole Superior, really, probably the largest of any Archean greenstone. Produced 170 million ounces, uh, sorry, tons um, of uh, copper zinc uh, ore. That represents uh, over 20% of all the uh, VMS mineralization produced within the Abitibi, so it's pretty significant. And we also have uh, a whole bunch of smaller uh, magmatic nickel copper deposits in the area as well. So what we decided to do here, there were previous um, seismic lines in this area, so under Metal Earth we decided that it would be really good to uh, sort of come back and look at these seismic sections but being able to compare them with MT is what we did in all our uh, metal earth transects. So we put in 80 MT stations across this area, about covering an area of about uh, 140 uh, kilometers north-south. And along two main lines, the, the lines where we had seismic previously done about 30 years ago, in the, uh, uh, less than that actually, 20 years ago, in the, in the mid-2000s under the Discover Abitibi initiative. So this uh, number of MT stations gave us uh, the ability to model uh, an area of about 10,000 square kilometers. So it gave us a really nice section, uh, long section through Timmins. And all this combining with the seismic helps us with the interpretation of uh, crustal architecture, where conductive corridors may uh, correlate with, uh, with known faults on the surface and alteration zones. So this is the, um, where all the stations are. You probably can't see them. There are all these little dots here. But this is the model that Addy created. And he talked about uh, a little bit about this uh, earlier today. Um, and it's just basically a series of crustal uh, set, uh, maps, if you like, or, or plan maps of the model going through at various steps. So at about a one to one and a half kilometers here, we just see little high um, conductivity areas or um, in, in a sort of a sea of, of, of high resistivity or, re or less conductive areas. And then as we go down at uh, four to five kilometers, we're starting to see some conductive areas blossom out. But particularly in the north, see that also at about eight to 10 kilometers. And then continuing down into the middle and lower crust, this northern area is really getting to be much more conductive. But the south is not particularly conductive. Maybe at, at greater depths it is a little bit more. But certainly in the upper crust, it's, it's, it's uh, certainly less conductive, more resistive. So uh, we've put together here uh, eight sections through the model. This is where all the lines are from east to west. Um, and in the, the westernmost part, it's not particularly conductive overall. There are some fingers of conductivity. But as you go through towards the east, 
you start to see conductivity blossom, and it's particularly up in this area in the north. And this is the, uh, the trace of the porcupine duster fault, and you can see uh, dominantly that conductivity is, is up in the northern part of the, uh, of the section. Whereas south of the porcupine duster, it's at least the upper crust is, is pretty resistive overall, with some uh, conductivity fingers, if you like. So this is the seismic. This is, well, this is the stuff that was done under Discover Abitibi. And, and as I mentioned, there were two seismic lines. The one to the west is what we call the, uh, the South Timmins line. There's another the small one up to the north. I'll show you a little later. Um, and so this is uh, uh, basically an enhancement of a, an interpretation that Dave uh, Snyder did a paper on in 2008. But what you can see here is the upper crust has um, uh, the green stones essentially have a different character than the mid to lower crust. So talking about the upper crust, we're really seeing in green lines here uh, where we have uh, uh, reflectors which are curved, and those represent some sort of uh, faulted uh, lithological units in the upper crust. And the red is where these, uh, all these uh, reflectors are transected, so we're interpreting these to be fault zones Many of them we're interpreting to be thrust, but it's a complicated uh, structural package up in the uh, upper part of the uh, in the upper part of, in the upper crust. A little bit less so to the south, um, and I think now with as we we have more data, we were able to capture more data from the uh, Discover Abitibi seismic, and that was reprocessed, so that that gave us some better imagery for the seismic, and it also gave us deeper imagery. So we see that here, there's some clear truncation suggesting the porcupine duster dips fairly steeply to the, to the south, which we really hadn't identified prior to this. And then we've got these zones where the, the seismic reflectivity diminishes, it basically disappears. You saw some of those earlier, I talked about those a little bit yesterday too. Um, so. We, we, you, if you, we use our, don't have to use too much imagination, we can join these together. Not exactly sure what they mean, but we see those in a lot of areas where we have these regional faults, so there may be a connection through the crust. See some of them to further to the north, which don't appear to go anywhere other than just up through the lower crust. So now we go to what we call the crawchest seismic line. It didn't go across the porcupine duster. So it's a little bit north of the, uh, the Timmins uh, uh, seismic line. And now we're seeing uh, the same sort of thing, lots of uh, uh, very convoluted green lines, which is basically, again, we think to represent a lot of folding of the, uh, the lithological units in the upper crust. But now the, these thrust faults appear to be uh, d dipping to the north as opposed to what we saw in around the Timmins area. And we see, for example, this is the uh, pipestone fault. And then there's another one. There's two packages of sediments that bound the Kid Monroe, much younger than the Kid Monroe, which is about 27, uh, 20 to 27, 10 million years. And that sort of suggests that maybe there's some sort of a pop-up structure there, uh, hypothesized. We're also seeing some um, features where uh, there's a tr um, a truncation of seismic that seems to go quite deep and maybe joining some of these through crust, crust growing uh, areas where we're losing seismic re reflectivity. Now, and this is the combined seismic and MT, so we can see now <clears throat> that it, from the Timmins uh, section seismic it, with the MT superimposed on it, or it's so superimposed on the, on the MT, that there's a quite a high, this overall a very resistive crust, but just south of Timmins in the upper crust is this very zone, zone of very high conductivity, and it seems to be uh, intersected by this uh, south-going porcupine duster. Um, the porcupine duster is in itself, um, uh, uh, you know, the locus of, in a broad sense, of many gold deposits 
But the, really, in, in the Timmins camp itself, there's only probably about 10% of the gold. Much of it is in subsidiary faults off to the north. So that's illustrated by uh, splay faults that, that are thought to join the porcupine duster at depth. And that was uh, basically from a, a model that Roger Bateman did in the 2008 paper on Timmins. But we're seeing up in the north here is something very different, this very large blob of conductivity. And uh, it's not right at the surface, it's down a couple, you know, five kilometers or so or more. And it seems to sit underneath where we find the porcupine sediments, but also under volcanics. And the porcupine sediments is an area we know we have thick units of graphitic argillite, so that's what we feel may be responsible for this, uh, this, this uh, high amount of conductivity. But we also have here to the north uh, a package of sediments which is actually the southern margin of the um, northern Abitibi. And if we look at the seismic, there's a bit of seismic here and the, uh, uh, the conductivity patterns, they go very deep here. And we see that in the Timmins line, but we also see that nicely in the uh, Crotchess. So we think that that may represent some sort of a boundary between the northern and southern Abitibi perhaps a suture zone, we're not sure. But again, we're seeing a lot of um, conductivity associated with these sediments to the north, the, uh, the scapa sediments. So um, getting back to gold, um, in the previous one, we think that a lot of the, these faults are, have conductivity that is associated with graphite and potentially sulfites and may have contributed to the gold. But we also have to think about the Kid Creek deposit with uh, 170 million ounces of uh, million tons of gold, and, and also a number of uh, copper, uh, nickel copper deposits in um, mafic and ultra mafic intrusions. They sit right on top of these conductivity zones, and as I pointed out, the, the crust in this area is very, uh, very uh, strongly folded and faulted. So it, these. Uh, deposits are in the order of uh, 27, 15, 27, uh, 5 million years for the, the Crawford. Um, and so uh, they were deposited long after all this folding and long before all this folding and thrusting. And it's quite possible that these conductivities are associated with them as well. And just for comparison purpose, I put a section that uh, Taus put in his paper to show you that there's a similar conductivity pattern to the best, the most endowed uh, VMS deposits in the uh, southern part of the, uh, the Naranda camp. Mind you, considerably less conductivity, but uh, uh, the pattern is very similar. So just to illustrate how we can get all these uh, sediments with their graphitic argillites associated with them, uh, Wouter Bleeker did a, a work in the Monroe uh, Township area about 80 kilometers east of Timmins and in a 2011 uh, open file report for the OGS, he put a, this model forward. So this is the Dust of Porcupine. You've got the Blake River to the north of it. It's, uh, it's, it's a, uh, basically a north-directed thrust. And all sorts of folding is, is interpreted north, where you've got the porcupine underlying the, uh, the uh, in this case, uh, the uh, Kid Monroe uh, volcanics. So this may be illustrative of what we have north of Timmins as well. So this is a three-dimensional version of, of what I've just been talking about these through-going zones, some of this uh, folding, potentially tapping into the, some of the conductivity, and then we have these north-directed uh, uh, folds up to the north, and, and this interpreted uh, break between the northern and southern Abitibi. And uh, these are some of the uh, things that we really talked about within the paper, so the key points, if you like. I'll let you read those. So the other thing I wanted to do here is just to compare Timmins with uh, the transects we've done to the east and west. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is Matheson, and then I'll talk about Swayze, because they're fairly close and they're right along the uh, interpreted distribution of the uh, porcupine duster fault. 
So this is uh, the, uh, the section that Raz put, Rasmus put together. And um, what, what this shows is that there's this zone of diminished um, reflectivity, which we interpret as to be some sort of a corridor. And the, you're seeing basically the uh, conductivity increase upwards, funneling upwards, if you like. And then the porcupine duster dips fairly shallowly in this area. We can see that in the seismic, but there's all sorts of drilling that shows that as well. And again, it's, it's thrust, uh, the rocks to the south are thrust uh, to the north, it's north verging. So there's a good uh, opportunity for a moderately endowed area, which is basically closely related to the porcupine duster, um, the mineralization such as at Taylor and at Black Fox. Being, uh, uh, fu being a tapping into this funneling upwards of, uh, of uh, potentially hydrothermal fluids, orifice uh, hydrothermal fluids. A and we also see uh, in the seismic here that the pipestone fault is dipping to the, to the north, so similar to what we saw in Timmins. And then to the east, uh, sorry, to the west, we have the um, Swayze which is less in doubt. Most of the conductivity is in the mid and the lower crust. And we have some uh, corridors up where most of them don't really reach the surface, such as this is the uh, interpreted uh, porcupine duster in this area. Uh, there may be a, a gold deposit closely associated with that. And uh, further to the east, the Joburg. And then the Rundle. Uh, in the southern, in the sub-central, and then in the south, the ride out, which is 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 one interpretation that might be the um, westward extension of the uh, Cadillac Larder Lake break, but very different character from Timmins. So I wanted to now show you what we see in the MT because that's higher resolution. We have a better idea what's going on in the, in the surface. So this is work that was done by a postdoc, uh, Gaetan Longe along with Adam Ola, who worked with him on the, uh, on the AMT data, created a model from that. And um, Gaetan's now with the Ontario Geological Survey. So uh, when we did the MT, uh, we invited uh, any companies that was interested to do a AMT. That would be basically uh, using our contract, but they would pay for the, um, for the data. And so uh, we did five, uh, four different companies joined in on that, and we did about 250 AMC stations in total in Timmins, the Timmins area. The one I'm really going to focus in on is, uh, is the one that uh, Newmont paid for, which is 150 stations, because they, they basically cover the, um, the, the Timmins camp, the Timmins uh, porcupine gold camp. So uh, basically, here's the geology. Uh, if you can see it from back there, the gold deposits are shown on the ones down in, in Tisdale, and then the ones in Hoyle and Whitney are up in here. Um, so I'm going to, it's just like the MT, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of um, plan sections at different depths. So this is the shallowest one at about uh, 200 meters depth. We're seeing conductivity in certain parts of the area. Along the porcupine duster fault, there seems to be a, a conductivity develop here and there. But we're seeing them closely associated with gold deposits, such as a Hoyle Pond, and we see some down around the, the dome mine, and the Onor Delonite uh, down in this area as well. These are close to the, uh, the porcupine duster. If we go a little deeper, we see uh, th this northern trend, uh, the Hoyle Pond, is extending a little further east and west, and also we're seeing uh, one developing just west of uh, Bell Creek. We're also still seeing this one along the Porcupine Duster. Uh, and these other ones that were close to Dome and uh, Buffalo Anchorite, um, they're still there, but they seem to be migrating northward. See even more of that, this one to the north is developing uh, quite strongly the Hoyle Pond Bell Creek trend. There's a new one up here to the north that seems to be deeper. This is about a kilometer depth. Don't know much about that. There's no outcrop. 
and not a lot of drilling. Um, the one along the Porcupine Duster basically seems to be going away. Uh, but this one uh, that's associated with uh, the dome is now coming up and around to the east, trending to the east, an arcuate pattern. And this one, uh, C3, is now extending up beneath uh, Hollinger McIntyre. We can see, continue to see that trend as we go down to about one and a half to one point, one and three quarters uh, uh, kilometers. And this uh, north trend is really strong now. The, the one further to the north is even developing a little more. This trend here, C2 to C4, and uh, the one from C3 up now past Hollinger McIntyre, and then a, another one that's appearing here, C7, which is along the Burroughs Benedict Fault. So we, we wanted to sort of try and figure out, oh, sorry, this, these are sections, four sections through the camp uh, to the, the uh, westernmost one here, showing this, this uh, conductive anomaly dipping fairly shallowly to the south down to about uh, two kilometers or so, going underneath Hollinger, the Hollinger trend. And then uh, this one here through Dome, uh, up to the north, uh, you see this same sort of thing, a, 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 a northerly, shallow northerly dipping trend of conductivity that, that extends right up to the crust. And then further along the, uh, this is along the Bell Creek trend, a little bit deeper one up in here. These ones, uh, we know that these are uh, at the surface are associated with uh, thick units of uh, graphitic argillate at the contact between the Tisdale Volcanics and the Porcupine, in this case Porcupine Volcanics, but they're overlined by the traditional Porcupine turbidites. Um, as we go further uh, to the west, this trend would take us up through Bell Creek, and we're seeing that northern anomaly. We're seeing some anomalies associated with the uh, Hall Nor deposit here, a little one associated with the, the, the Porcupine Duster, and then there's a, a larger one to the south. We don't know, it. there's no deposits down there, but there are um, uh, uh, porcupine sediments with argillites, graphitic argillites. And then finally, uh, we're seeing uh, more here in the uh, easternmost uh, uh, transect, a, a big one associated with a oil pond, and then this one to the north, which probably would be a good thing for somebody to have a look at. So we wanted to think about what the potential causes of the conductive anomalies would be. So here's some hypothetical uh, possibilities for why they, we have conductivity. Down here it shows you the conductivity uh, values uh, or the resistivity values, depending on what you want to call them. But we see that uh, uh, graphites and sulfides are probably the ones that have the highest conductivity, but also salt water. And, in various uh, parts of uh, volcanic units have uh, moderately high. So if we look at these maps here, this is where we see, you know, thick units of graphitic sediments. So this is the one that's at the base of the porcupine. This is also at the base of the porcupine. Uh, there's a lot of graphitic sediments associated between the Tisdale and the porcupine up in this area. So we see good correlation with graphite. This is where we have, uh, you know, uh, uh, quartz, host, quartz vein hosted gold. So you see a good correlation in a lot of the deposit areas with, with uh, the conductive anomalies as well. And this is with ultramafic rocks. So we think that altered ultramafic rocks associated with the uh, porcupine duster are largely responsible for this one. So what we decided is that, well, we had all these patterns, but we wanted to quantify it with rock types. So um, we ha had an opportunity to do uh, rock property measurements from samples. And so we collected 250 samples. And these were all basically from drill core. Uh, 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 many of the companies in the areas gave access to their core. And we sampled through the mineralized zones and rocks in and around it. And these were all done at the uh, Canadian Geological Survey uh, Petrophysics Lab Laboratory, and we did analyze, and they were um, uh, analyzed for resistivity, chargeability, porosity, magnetic susceptibility, and density. 
So this is just basically showing you, this is all the different rock types, the, uh, the symbols represent them, uh, and, the, and the resistivity values, uh, resistivity values very low, so these are the conductive ones. So you can quickly see, if you, you probably can't back there, but I'll tell you, the really basically, the graphitic rocks in, are this cluster of very uh, conductive rocks. And the ones that are mineralized, which basically with, sulfa, uh, with sulfides associated with them, they have higher density as well. Uh, they're also very, uh, very conductive. The rest of the rocks uh, um, uh, moderately to, to, uh, to, to pretty strongly resist up. So again, uh, this is just showing you the chargeability the same way. So the high, high chargeability, low resistivity, the blue samples, those are the ones that are, that are conductive. So what we did here, um, Gaetan did, is he put together charts of all the different rock types that we had sampled through core. Um, and uh, just basically at the top, these are the ultramafics. The uh, dark blue are the unaltered, and the lighter uh, shade of blue are altered. So you can see the altered stuff is, is, is uh, moderately uh, conductive. Uh, for uh, mafic volcanic rocks, um, the dark green are the um, unaltered and similar to the ultramafic, the light green are uh, slightly more conductive, but you know, still pretty resistive. Uh, this is the reds are uh, QFPs, so uh, a little bit reverse here, the altered ones are a little bit more uh, resistive. So we're looking at the uh, graphitic rocks here, and they're all, they're the ones that show really high uh, conductivity, low resistivity. These are just your standard in the light gray, the standard porcupine sediments, and they're pretty uh, resistive on it without being, uh, seeing any graphite in them. So we did, a, a going through a sections, I guess, through a number of the deposits. This is through oil pond, the uh, red arrows on the side of, the, uh, this, uh, of, of where we sampled the core. Uh, it indicate areas we have mineralization, and you can see that also by the assay values we got from that. And then uh, <clears throat> there are all sort of uh, orangey colored areas. They're um, within the mafic volcanics, they call them uh, gray zones, so they're sulfide rich and uh, they have some graphite in them as well. And then the black lines are where we have graphitic fault systems, so we're seeing uh, some uh, evidence of graphitic fault systems uh, having uh, obviously uh, very resist, uh, conductive and high chargeability, and some of these have good, uh, good gold values associated with them, and that goes right through. So this is basically all the Tisdale with ultramafics in the central part of it and porcupine to the north and south, and graphitic faults are very common at the contact uh, between the volcanics and the in the porcupine sediments. <coughs> Sorry. Same thing for Bell Creek, um, looking at um, high values associated with contacts with the sediments and graphitic faults and some of these uh, gray zones as well. Again, some, some graphitic uh, fault zones um, with good, uh, good, con uh, good conductivity and chargeability, but in, in that instance, not much gold associated with them. So basically, you get a picture. We, we have a, a fairly good amount of data from, from a lot, number of these deposits. I, I'm not going to show you all of them. But I think we can see a pretty good coincidence between uh, conductivity and graphite. So um, overall, the, the conductivity or anomalies are, are spatially associated with known gold deposits in Timmins. and Timmins. Uh, the trend to the north, the Hoyle Pond, uh, Bell Creek, is a very large, long conductive anomaly, about uh, greater than 20 kilometers. Dome and Hollinger ones, the C2 and C3, uh, are associated with graphitic units within the porcupine. And we know that because you can basically see those in drill core. Uh, so the Timmins camp anomalies are related to graphitic faults, spatially asso associated with high grades of gold, and gold mineralization, mineralized mafic volcanic rocks with disseminated graphite and sulfides. The gray zones are, uh, are anomalously conductive as well. 
So then, uh, just to conclude, the strongest MT con uh, conductors in the Abitibi and the, every transect that we've looked at coincide with highly elevated gold and VMS uh, and VMS in the in the Timmins uh, camp area and the Kid Creek as well. Uh, the porcupine duster marks the boundary between uh, higher upper crustal uh, conductivity in the north but lower in the south. So it's major, some sort of a major boundary of uh, what's going on in the upper crust in the Timmins area. And uh, both the uh, porcupine duster and pipe zone faults are associated with lower crustal seismic discontinuity, discontinuities and conductivity related to crustal scale faulting and pathways for migration of auriferous fluids, potentially. Uh, the AMT anomalies in Timmins camp are associated with auriferous zones, graphite sulfides, and quartz carbonate veins. And the uh, crustal scale elevated conductors and truncations of seismic reflections in the north mark a potential tectonic boundary between the northern and southern Abitibi at the uh, south contact of the Scapa sediments, which are all, also have uh, graphitic uh, sedimentary units which are conductive. So that's it. Thank you.